What was the best thing about living with me and what was the worst thing about living with me? Every time we were having sex, your phone would ring. It certainly felt like every time, which you can understand, you know, busy cases and on call and all that, but it was the fact that you answered it, Jubilant, that is unforgivable and disrespectful and very disappointing. Family law court bombing. A series of three murders and five bombings that occurred between 1980 and 1985 in Sydney. A lovely woman, Pearl Watson, she was the wife of another family court justice, Ray Watson. She did what she usually does in the morning when her husband is just finishing packing his briefcase. As she opened the door, she was thrown back through two brick walls, two internal mm. brick walls, lost her limbs and her head and of course died instantly. Mm. There's a four kilogram bomb found in a car wired to the ignition of a solicitor of the family court. We had scientific unit and they came, they thought it was a joke. Yeah. Uh, they came and saw the capacity of it and the only equipment that they had to make D it safe. Disarm it was to place a fishing hook around the detonator. The I Catch Killers podcast was a fresh start for me as I left policing behind and started a new life. Over the years, we've laughed together, cried and shared some powerful moments. Welcome to I Catch Killers. Welcome back to part three of my chat with retired Detective Chief Inspector Pamela Young. If you missed the first couple of episodes, we got to learn a little bit about Pam's career and some of the interesting investigations that she led. You'd also found out what goes on in the home of uh, two highly strung homicide detectives because we lived together for quite some, some time. Now we're going to talk about uh, an investigation that I think, Pam, and, and full credit to you, I say it up front, the family law court bombings, it was something that was a, a blight on our, um, a, a blight on our state or even the country that, uh, you know, judicial officers were being, being targeted. Mm. So the significance of the uh, investigation should never be understated. I'll let you talk us through that investigation. You became involved later in the investigation because it was a reinvestigation and uh, I want you to take us right through that investigation because I think it's it's a fascinating story in itself but in keeping with the um, we'll delve into the dark areas we're also going to delve into the interesting areas because it's not often that you get two people in a podcast that, that were both homicide detectives and lived together I was taught very early in my career policing career not to ask questions that you don't know the answer to <laughs> And but I'm going to throw caution to the wind, and I've got two <laughs> questions for you. You can choose which one you answer first. What was the best thing about living with me, and what was the worst thing about living with me? And please be kind. <laughs> oh well, I'll be um, efficient, so I'll deal with the shorter of those two, which is the bad good things. things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I, I. Um, was first endeared to you when you came up with something that you thought would um, uh, um, make me like you after I had rejected you. <laughs> this is interesting, yes. Because I, I said, um, I don't think we've got much in common other than work, cause, and I'm more into arts and cultural things, and you're a sports person. True. So... Um, there was a delay with us getting together, but then you found a play on boxing. <laughs> I still think that's one of the better <laughs> plays I've ever seen. That was a great call, wasn't it? Really clever, because I don't think there'd ever been a play on boxing before that or since, but you just found one. You <laughs> researched and hunted it down, <laughs> and um, you uh, invited me to a uh, Play, so I got my arts and you got your sport because it was yeah. a play on boxing. So I thought that was um, a big tick. Well, <laughs> so. well, I'm glad that there was something I liked plays. <laughs> but uh, it was, yeah, we were, uh, we had different interests, but it, uh, you broadened my scope on uh, on things. I'm not I sure how so. how much I broadened your, your scope on uh, on different things. But yeah, I, I do have an interest in the theatre now and uh, have continued that on. I still to this day haven't been able to find another one about boxing, but uh, I, yeah. I keep, uh, keep look, looking out for it. Okay, so that was the highlights of living with me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I do have other things little things on the list. So um, a very, a very passionate and generous lover, Jubilant. Oh, God. We, 
I, yeah, I wasn't <laughs> expecting that, but thank you. I'll take take and the compliment. The bonus was you also were very good at cleaning the house, so that combi- combination was perfect. <laughs> Well, as they say, behind every good woman, there's a little man in the house. <laughs> that was that was my my role. Oh, and there's something else. Yep. Um, it was seeing you be such a good father to your children. Yeah. I believe their names are in public. In <laughs> yeah, the public. J- Jake, so Jake and Gemma. And Gemma. Yeah, we can we can um, we can talk about them. And seeing them bring out a soft affection and um, giggles. Yeah. In you. That no one else in the whole world could. Well, that that actually means a lot because people' perception of me when I was in the police, at least, was uh, yeah. yeah, not much fun in this life. It's just yeah. a, a serious hard, hard ass. But um, yeah, and you've gone into a, a, an area that's a, a, and it affects so many people too. You come into the life, and I bring uh, a little bit of baggage. I've got uh, got two kids, but uh, you're a good influence on them too. So I'll compliment you. Uh, compliment uh, you I'm, there. I'm and glad. you do realise we're having this conversation for all the public to listen to. <laughs> yeah. <so laughs> yeah. We better move on. Okay. Um, so, oh, uh, uh, that, uh, let's not forget yeah. that second question. Oh, right. I was going to move straight into the family law court bomb. <laughs> okay. What, what was the problems living with me? So um, definitely the fact that um, every time we were having sex, your phone would ring. <laughs> it certainly felt like every time, which you can understand, you know, busy cases and on call and all that. But it was the fact that you answered it, Jubilin, that is unforgivable and disrespectful and very disappointing. So that's uh, the top of the negative list. <laughs> they, 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 were, they were important phone calls. Half the time they were informants. Oh, when the other activity wasn't, thank you for that. I, so, <laughs> oh, shit, I'm digging myself in, into a hole. <laughs> and it, yeah, anyway, yep. um, I, re- I regret that, Pam. I apologise. Yeah, I publicly <laughs> said I apologise for answering the phone whilst having sex. <laughs> um, I really didn't take to the distance we had to live away from the office for you to be close to your children i i understood it yeah um i understood why it was important but i didn't like it physically because i'm not a morning person so the other good thing about living with you was how you would wake me up gently it seemed like middle of the night pretty well was uh you'd um dress me yep carry me to the car (laughs) tuck a little um, package of Vegemite toast in my briefcase for when I woke up. <laughs> That's true. And, I'm surprised you realised we lived a long way from uh, <laughs> from the office because you slept the whole time and I just woke yeah. you up when we're driving into the car park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the toast had gone cold by then. Yeah, so well, I, I wrapped it in foil. I tried to keep it warm. I did my best. <laughs> yeah. But uh, okay, well, yeah, interesting times. If you want to uh, get an insight into what it's like, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the pressures of on call, uh, living in a household where people uh, like the phone call can yeah dictate your life for the next uh, next couple of months. So you don't know where you're going to head. Let's get off the personal stuff for a bit. <laughs> And uh, family law court bombing. Um, hmm. Can you give us an overview of that if people don't uh, are not familiar with the uh, particular case? Yes. So it was a series of three murders and five bombings that occurred between 1980 and 1985 in Sydney. Yep. Mostly targeting uh, the Family Court of Australia. Um, it was my first deployment out of the academy to guard the homes of judges along with a lot more professional and experienced yeah. <laughs> hundreds of others. Huge resources went into it. And it was the last case that I was asked to solve by yep. chance. There's that There's that link. So... Um, That's a nice end, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yes, the, the crimes uh, started in yeah, 1980 with Justice Opus being shot as he answered his door yep. um, at close range by an unknown offender. Uh, then uh, four years later, oh, by the way, he his children and wife were home, of course, at the yep. time. Uh, four years later, um, a bomb is placed on the doorstep of... Justice G, another judge of the yep. family court, uh, the bomb went off in the middle of the night, took down most of his house in which 
he and his two children were sleeping. Fortunately and unexpectedly, they survived, yep. of course, um, injured and scarred, um, but, but survived. Uh, then, uh, within a short period after that, and there was a bomb placed at the courthouse at Parramatta, so the Family yep. Court of Australia courthouse. It uh, was placed near a supporting pillar, so if it had been more successful, it quite possibly could have taken down most of mm, that could building. Have been Fortunately, yep. no one was injured then. Uh, then there's a, um, a, a lovely woman, Pearl Watson. She was the wife of another family court justice, Ray Watson. She did what she usually does in the morning when he, her husband is just finishing packing his briefcase. She went to open her front door to wave to the government driver. Yep. So they all had drivers um, for, for good reason. Uh, she was intending to wave to say, My, you know, yep. he'll be out soon. She also worked at the family court, but she wasn't going to work on that particular day. Um, as she opened the door, she was thrown back through two brick walls, two internal mm. brick walls, and um, lost her limbs and her head and, of course, died instantly. Mm. Uh, then there's a um, four-kilogram bomb found in a car wired to the ignition of a solicitor of the family court. Um, if there's anything amusing in any of this, it's when the... Because it was in the days we, we didn't have bombings. No, no. It's... <laughs> and uh, we didn't have a bomb squad as such. We had scientific unit. And they came, they thought it was a joke. Yeah. Uh, they came and saw the capacity of it. And the only equipment that they had to... Um, make it safe, Disarm it. was to place a fishing hook around the detonator. And with the rod then, they went to the back of the house, so a regular suburban house surrounded by other houses. Of course, this was after everyone had been moved to a safe yeah. distance. From the back of the house, they reel in <laughs> the fishing hook, which renders the bomb safe. Okay. We ended up... Um, buying uh, the same car model and blowing it up and it would have we could have we showed it could have um destroyed that whole house and if it, if surrounding it, if it did ones as well detonate. a, a yeah. very large bomb the reason it didn't detonate was the see so that that uh, the solicitor of the family court had lived there but had moved out quite recently right the tenants who were there um peter he went to work on his car which was parked on the driveway. And he, he literally he sat in the driver's seat to turn the ignition. He, he stopped. Yep. He thought, no, if I turn on the ignition, the exhaust pipe, which is what he wanted to work on, would get hot. Oh, geez, that was lucky, wasn't so it? So in a moment, he hmm. decided not to um, uh, turn the car on. So he... Um, then in, in preparing to work on it, he opened the bonnet. He discovered the four kilo bomb in that car. Yep. Uh, so how lucky is that? Yeah, yeah. And then um, then we have, by now we're in 1985, then we have a very large explosion of a bomb under the podium at the Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall yep. Temple um, in uh, Western Sydney. At that time, there was a congregation gathered of um, about 120 people, mm. and the bomb was placed directly under where the preacher was speaking. Uh, he was, when the bomb went off, he was thrown up through what was now um, vacant ceiling space, yep. roof space, and he he landed in a tree, and most of his clothes were removed in the blast. Yep. He survived amazingly with fractures. Uh, the randomness of bombs shows by there was one victim, one f victim who died. Yeah. David, he was sitting in the second row from uh, where the preacher was with his family. 
and he died instantly. Yeah. He had, um, by chance, turned to his wife. Of course, he had no idea what was about to happen, but she told the police at the time that the last words he said to her was, I love you. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. really, uh, really... Again, just uh, like uh, outlining those those offences, the magnitude of it is hard to comprehend. Uh, even like for, it is, for, it for us as, as homicide detectives, and we've we've seen a lot of shit. But that is just is, the magnitude is. and the random, uh, not random, because it, it was targeted. But the the victims, a catastrophic effect when you start placing bombs in uh, locations yes. like that. With that, with the church one, there were roughly ninety seven. Um, seriously injured yeah. people, um, 70 went to hospital, 16 were children and five babies. Yeah. Uh, at that time, they weren't absolutely clear whether they were targeted I, and linked yep. or random. Um, but uh, we got to the bottom of that when um, the case came to me in 2013. And yeah... We got to the okay. bottom of it. Well, I, I want to want to break it down because I, I, I've found that particular case fascinating, and I remember before you were at Unsolved Homicide, I did a stint there, and I think you took took my place when I, I took some time off, and uh, I was asked to have a look at that investigation, just to have a cursory look mm. look over it. And I remember, I think we had a conversation. I said, Jesus, uh, like I, I hadn't appreciated. I, I worked on it like you as a young uniform officer mm. where we were, had to camp out the front of uh, the judges' homes uh, to protect the, the judges. But, yeah, it was a fascinate, fascinating mm. case, a mm. lot of stuff. There was a lot, you know, resources were put into it. And I, I've got to say, I, I'm, I'm surprised in a way that didn't come to a conclusion. I know, like, investigations, um, you know, uh, evolve and it's... It's easier sometimes to investigate all the uh, uh, matters, but yeah, it just it died, didn't it? Most of our most of our homicide career, it was never mentioned. The family law court bombings, was it? There wasn't something that uh, was actively being worked on. Uh, no, I guess no case can be in its entirety. Yeah. Uh, but at that time, there's full effort. The prime minister, who was Bob Hawke at that yeah. time, he announced he got involved. He announced the largest what was called a task force then, the Joint Bomb Task Force, which was combining the uh, New South Wales Police, Federal Police and the military. So we had no no real, we needed explosive knowledge. Uh, So, and of of about 120 personnel, so certainly the biggest to that time and... Well, effectively, just, all, all the resources <laughs> and, that uh, went yes. on. It. Okay, well, let's fast forward. So you're yeah. the uh, you're uh, the detective chief inspector in charge of unsolved homicide, mm. and you've got the uh, uh, that case has been allocated to you. Mm, yes, it had been reviewed a few times. Yep. Um, people had gone back into it, but we did a we dug deep and did a reinvestigation. Yeah. So what happened within the first a few months is. Um, you would have known when you were there, but there's a certain group of uh, investigators there at, um, can we call it cold case? Or yeah, you want co- to go uh, the unsolved uh, homicide? Co- uh, cold case. <laughs> Everyone no knows difference. what that is. Just the cold case unit. Work on <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, who just knew that it was, uh, you know, uh, that knew and were prepared to dig for exhibits long thought to be have been destroyed. Yeah. Uh, which would have been perfectly within policy yeah. at that time because you can't keep the billions of exhibits yeah. always collected, uh, but were prepared to do the grunt work, which was literally dig and and in in a way defy exhibit officers that said no, it's not on our list, it's and, not and, here. And breaking breaking that down, that it's just to give people a sense of what we're talking about here, quite often it's going to some dusty room mm. and uh, brushing the dust and cobwebs off and going through old boxes and looking for bits and pieces. Isn't yes. It? it really is. It's a painstaking, dirty job. Yes. Because it's from an era um, where the, the, the term DNA, the idea of it, the concept of it was alien. Yeah. So we've got to remember it, it's at a time when no one knew that in the future it was possible. DNA 
wasn't readily available to law enforcement till so, the early uh, uh, 90s, in fact. 100%. <laughs> and so for an exhibit, those old exhibits, if you, well, we've got a photograph of it. Do we need to yes. keep it? Because like, yes. w- uh, there's no forensic value retaining this yes. in the exhibit room. Yes, and blood, it would, you'd get a blood group. Yeah. That was that was it. Yeah. So then get rid of the bloodied exhibit. Uh, so um, Matt, yep. who uh, was one of those... Um, senior constables you so, worked with. Yeah, say so, say so, so, no. Um Matt Heffernan. We're not going to attack him, so I think No, I always think it's up yeah. to the individual to want to be named. I th- I'm sure he's in public anyway. Yeah. But anyway, Matt, hello. Mm. Uh, so, and he was one of the ones that um, was just ready to do the work, yeah. the hands-on work, uh, relentlessly. He did find within... So we started in 2013 and in, and in October he's digging, been digging and digging and he gets to then areas of the Sydney Police Centre and he f- finds, of course, the damp, smelly bags, mm. keeps going in some dark corner and he sees a ripped corner of a bag that had the word... I, I don't quote me on it, yeah. <laughs> but it, Jehovah or some such. Okay. So yeah. related to the, the bombing, the bombing I, I've just yeah. mentioned. Uh, so then um, in there, yeah. he found cardboard and carpet. Yep. Uh, that was not from the bombing. That was from a break and enter that had occurred at that Jehovah's Witness temple the week prior okay. to it. Yep. Um and the scientific officers of the day, who who were the ones going to each scene, too mostly, uh, they just thought it's worth grabbing. Yeah, didn't know what they could do with it. It's it worth grabbing, well to it. <laughs> and and it could have been destroyed within policy. It wasn't. We tested that, and and around the, those few months yeah. after we'd started, we did uh, get a result, which was the blood on the carpet belonged to the father of a woman known as Trudy. Right. Okay. So we um, so we went to Trudy and her father was Leonard John Warwick. Okay. Remember that name? So um, this is a good time to say, yeah. a lot of people think and a lot of shows can suggest that finding DNA is the be-all and end-all. Yeah. We worked for it. It was at least another 18 months yeah. after that. Um, and remember that was from one offence and not even the offence, but and just the location. I, I think break that down because I, I think due credit for yourself and your team that, that worked on it, that is by no means a set of facts that you can present to the court because no. DNA was found from a break and enter in a place that was blown up a week later. It's yes. At points, perhaps you can place some weight on it pointing you in a direction, but it's yes. not uh, of evidentiary value on its own. No, it's it's not. Nor was I going to be satisfied with the because I was convinced the offences were linked. Yeah, uh, I wasn't going to be satisfied with charging with one offence mm. and saying, well, at least we we got did him for that a break and, and then exactly. Yeah. So so uh, what then then happened is just a very good focus small team that I um, was. Um, merciless with uh, in that they're all very motivated and um, uh, developed expertise in areas. So we had a bomber. So Mel was mm. a bomber. She could have built bombs yep. for us. She had to learn it as a lay person because yeah. it was always, well, is it possible for that for that to happen? Uh, we, you know, um, others are building rapport with witnesses who were much older, um, forgetful, uh, not willing to be involved in something that had been, um, you know, promised a mm. solution earlier and it had never come. There are all these nuanced, uh, necessary approaches, including um, what we didn't find in the 153 archive boxes from yeah. the previous investigation was a complete set of family law court transcripts. So where it all came together was, um, you know how I'm pretty good on paper? Yeah, I know you're very good on paper. And you know how yeah. irritatingly good I am with small details? Yes, you're a pain. <laughs> so I determined to write up the evidence, yep. every bit. And I formed a, 
a document. It ended up being 110 pages um, long. And to the listeners here, sometimes a slight obsession helps in an <laughs> investigation. But yes. Um, so the document, which ended up being an aid, aid memoir for the Department of Public Prosecutions, yes. uh, was fed by the experts that my team had yeah. developed. And so, can we just break that down? Because I, I, I think our listeners are interested in the, the dynamics of investigations. But going through, and we talked in one of the earlier episodes about little things are important, but when you actually document it, I often, when I was stuck on an investigation, I'd type it down, okay, if I, I think this person has done this crime, I'm going to type up a set of facts and have a look at it, stare at it and see, okay, what's in there? But going through in that uh, infinite detail that you went, it helps understand what you've got because you can't you can't retain all that information in, in your brain. Precisely. Yeah. Plus... It's no use even if you can retain it in your brain. Yeah. It's not about you. It's about you convincing... What you can present. Yes. What you, convincing yeah. your hierarchy, which was necessary in this case, beyond that, the prosecutors, yeah. that there's a worthy case for them to be involved in and mm. invest in. So, yes, writing up, I, I com- no, we shared that. Uh, that approach absolutely uh, essential. Well, I, I, I think I, I learnt a little bit from you on that in, in investigations because you're always about put it, put it down in writing. I'd be going, this happened, that happened, blah blah blah. Yeah, put it down in writing. So yeah. I, I, I learnt something, and, and I, 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 hope, yeah. I, I tried to pass that on to people too. Yeah, the and it, of it gives you clarity yeah. in your own mind. And is it is it convincing in in writing to any any other relevant party to yeah. read? Is essential. So that was my approach. So it was a work in progress. It's not like we got mm. to the end and I thought I'll just whip this up. It it grew and developed and and was a very unwieldy document to make a, a chronological or because it because it it was fed by our discoveries. And and so, and, and going back again, I, j- I just want to break it down. You said you, your team how you you drove them. You did drive them. I, I mm. saw what, saw what was going on. And you need on investigation sometimes the breakthroughs and you know take this as a compliment and uh, but I, I firmly believe it. You need people just driving it, pushing, pushing, pushing because the ones the difficult ones to crack are the ones that people go above and beyond. And I know you and your team went above and beyond. It it really was a huge effort. Yeah. And I really appreciate my team um, bearing with it some a couple went by the wayside it was too intense uh but the ones that remained and uh, that wonderful humor you get um um i uh with the intensity i i put on them and, and all my teams um it's apparently called being pamorized <laughs> So uh, I think that was quite. I, I think you, that, you pick uh, up on what that might mean. Yeah, ter- <laughs> so. terrified. I reckon that, <laughs> yeah. that was. But uh, no, you've it, you've got to drive it. And I I'm, yeah. I'm 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 big on this, and this is where the passion comes into it. Like if people fall by the wayside, well, get out of there. Like this yes. is a homicide investigation, and I uh, you know it doesn't make me popular. But if people are not up to it, don't do it. We, yes. You're not a conscript. Don't strut around calling yourself a homicide detective yes. unless you're prepared to pay the price. Yes, so, yes. And I, I know you share that, and I know you paid the price, and, and your team that you got working harmoniously, the ones that stuck through with it. Uh, yes. And even uh, just uh, what I found useful, there was uh, there were one or two um, experienced doubters, so experienced in that they could their opinion could be relied upon, but mm. they doubted that uh, Leonard Warwick had committed all the crimes. So uh, I found it very useful to task them with being the devil's advocate yes, and solely the devil's advocate. They weren't involved in any of the other aspects. Yep. Devil's advocate on the other suspects, which the mm. original investigation had dug up a lot. Um, so, some were... Like there was one standout for for the Watson matter, the one yeah. where um, Mrs. Watson she died. Uh, it's absolute standout. He'd been part of the construction crew for the um, for the apartment block. He'd been in the military. He so he's ticking a few he, 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 some red flags. There. Yeah, yeah, and he'd come out and said how much he hates hates them all. But uh, yeah. so uh, but a real good use of devil's but advocate that, because you you. If you don't do it yourself, 
the defence are going to. Yeah, the defence yeah. are going to bring up these things. So, and it, it, it's a good way to use use stuff. And we're yes. talking the, here at the management level of an investigation, which, which we don't often talk. We, we more get into the, you know, the nitty gritty of it. But from a management point of view, I, I call them the what ifs. I'd, I'd be saying this happened. Oh, but what if it's that person? Yes. And it's a good way. Okay, we'll back it up. Yes. Put it in writing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You go. Okay. You, yeah. Because the, they're the doubters and the what if types in investigations yeah. are. If it plays out the way you said or believe it's playing out, yep. they go, oh, well, I just thought I'd raise it. And if it doesn't, then they strut around going, oh, well, I said. Yep. Yeah. So it's a good way to uh, for anyone listening that might end up running a uh, homicide investigation yep. for the, the doubters or what ifs, give them the task to uh, prove yes, what they're saying. Yes, yes. It, it's um, important and can be useful comment for yeah. people to make. Everyone is should contribute. Every good leader encourages and even makes people contribute but so many jobs get bogged down yeah. in th- that conversation it yeah. doesn't go further than that type of conversation yeah. Yeah. someone's got to come through with clarity yeah. what are what are your the best prospects here we're going for them we even and it's a term you yeah. use you even should get tunnel vision yeah on on the good ones until that tunnel vision is not justified yeah with limited resources, you must concentrate your efforts. Yeah. That's a way of concentrating your efforts. So with um, with your comment earlier about, mm. you know, isn't it surprising it wasn't solved earlier? Yeah. I might share that too. Though I know yeah. they worked very hard and in very different circumstances, just with information uh, management and being able to one, uh, recall uh, Yeah, we're talking things. about card system as we, distinct we from are. computer and no DNA and every, everything yeah. else that goes yeah. into play. Yeah. 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 But... Um, what I discovered yep. was uh, through close reading of the thousands of pages of mm. family court transcripts, uh, uh, lots of things, but this is just a demonstration, yep. which is so Justice Opus, who was Leonard John Morick's first victim, yep. he had, he, um, uh, Warwick was before the family court because his wife, Andrea wanted to one divorce and property settle. Yeah. So Justice Opus was the first justice trying to s- sort Resolve through that. these yep. applications. Um, the orders become very complex and it's very tedious to read because there's, yeah. I think you've had court matters with family court. Yes, ha- I've been you? through the family and law court. And they're quite convoluted, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> don't start me. So, don't start, don't am I triggering? The, Are there pu- any triggers happening here? Don't push these <laughs> so, buttons. So, All good, I've moved on. So, um, so Justice Opus uh, would make multiple orders. Yep. So, f- and just an example, one was um, after, after the parties have um, just putting in layman's yeah. terms, after the parties have um, uh, done A, B, C, D and E, yeah. uh, then a period of seven days can pass until all the all the um, documents are exchanged. Yeah. For instance, that's the type of thing. So that can happen over six, eight, ten separate hearing yeah. dates. Uh, so I... I the, those transcripts and I remember sitting there <laughs> counting after all the putting them in sequence mm. working out what, what this process of and then the seven day thing yeah. which is counting the date mm. from when the order was made or when the last you know seventh step was made um, so counting the days specifically around Opus's orders and, and the day that I came up with on my fingers yep. was the day that Opus was shot dead at his door. Okay. Now, I I'm really hopeless at maths, yeah. hopeless. Yeah. But I I managed to do that. <laughs> on your I, I I doubted yeah. it. I, doubt, I It was so clear and such heavy evidence, yeah. heavy good evidence. I thought I've missed something, and I went back, went back. But, but, no, but, I hadn't but again, anything. the thoroughness of it, that, okay, it, it, it well, is. That's a, yeah. that's a huge coincidence, isn't <laughs> it? Is. it? Then, then you're looking at it. They, they, and it these are the things hadn't that, been discovered before. Yeah, these are the no. type of things that sort of kick in and you think, okay, well, maybe I am heading in the, in the yeah. right direction. Because you, you do doubt yourself, don't you? When you're running an investigation yes. like that, like there's a lot of pressure yes. to get it right. Yes, uh, and you should doubt yourself. Yeah. It's this tricky balance, isn't it? Com- well, confidence, clarity, 
doubt. And <laughs> You've got to have it in the I, right I've mix, got to say, so. sometimes I've had investigations where above have interfered and I've been frustrated because I've yes. had the report and have to answer all this. But by the time it comes to court, yes. I'm glad they interfered because it, it's I've, I've got everything prepared yes. and, and that. But even – and it's a robust um, – field to work in, homicide investigation. Yes. Everyone's got an opinion. And I was not against other people having opinions because that helped me check myself if I was heading off in the direction and someone mm. else said something. But, uh, yeah, I, I find it fascinating the amount of detail. I know how thorough you are, but they're the type of things that can sometimes get uh, investigations across the line. Mm. So will we skip forward to the result? Uh, or, well, well or? You, what um, I remember um, reading the brief, it was something about a clock was quite interesting. Yes, yeah, yeah, so, so we ended that. up. So the whole, uh, so the, all the elements. It was. It was a. Um, oh goodness, what's that term? A um, circumstantial. That that term. <laughs> you have. How long have you been out of the cops? So that's right. You have direct or circumstantial. Yeah, Jesus. So okay. It was circumstantial. Uh, but so many elements like. Um, so when we looked at the photographs of search warrants conducted on Leonard Warren, because he, he, he was, was a one person of, of interest. He was yeah. a person of interest in, in a, a pool original. of them. Yeah. Uh, we looked at the photographs that had been taken during search warrants at his home. Yeah. Uh, and then we conducted our own search warrant and we found in both... Uh, the same brand clock that had been used to time one or two of the and, devices. And it, was, it was a breakdown of the components in the clock that uh, that's uh, from the bombing. That's what they see. So that's that's my understanding. Of yes, it. Yeah. yes. To know it was a certain brand clock, and then yes, the and same. Yes, the same was found in his possession. And see this type of evidence, because when you go to court, people are going to attack your uh, integrity, attack everything. Mm. But those type of ev- that type of evidence really stands up. Well, you know, how have we created that? There's a photo of the clock. This is a component that was mm. found in the bomb, mm. and uh, that is in that clock. Yeah, yes, it's fascinating. It is. Yeah. So all those all those elements came yep. together. None of them, which is the nature of circumstantial briefs. Yeah. None of them by themselves are, are the um, the home run, uh, but in combination, and we, uh, th- you know, the elements come together, and they're often better briefs than direct briefs because yeah. it stands alone. So when we did, uh, so I I knew towards the end when I just knew we had him. Yeah. I also knew we didn't need to interview him. Yeah. We prepared an interview, but we didn't need him to say anything. Yeah. Truth or lies, we did not need anything from him because the circumstantial brief was so good. Yeah. Uh, there, yeah. Well, I, I remember the interviewing because you did approach me at one stage and uh, said, uh, uh, look, uh, I, this is building up. I'd like you, uh, would it be possible, would you be interested in interviewing him yes. in resources to do the what you do in an interview room. Yes. I was so excited. I spent the whole weekend yes. re- reading up on the brief and think, I know how I'm going to approach this lunatic. And uh, But we had a discussion. You said yes. you want to run, and I, I agree with you, you wanted to run it past your team. If they wanted to have a go at it, I think it was more appropriate they had a go at it. But I've got to say, I was disappointed because I wanted to have a crack at him. Yes. Uh, I, I think it would have been a fascinating uh, I think discussion. I think it would fascinating to watch. And you had always an awesome fearless reputation as an interviewer in fact i've uh, had it in mind if i get a get a chance to ask you anything <laughs> it would have been what it, what are your tips yeah yeah it's, uh, whether that's I, now or later or yeah, never it's well, up to you it, it's, it was my passion you know that was my uh, go to place and my, my fun place and I, I think you brought me on one other investigation and i still remember what i did in that interview room and i'm so proud it was all above board there was nothing un- mm. untoward but just jammed up a solicitor and his client Big time, and uh, yeah. the amount of preparation you have to do before the interview, you have got to prepare yourself because knowledge is power in the interview room. So you need to know so much detail about that person. So if they take you off on a tangent or whatever, you can bring them back. You've got to have a strategy. You've got to be flexible in your thinking with the strategy. Sometimes I pre- prepare a couple of strategies. He's either going to talk, he's going to deny it, or all this. So you've got to be um, flexible in the way that you approach it. And create the atmosphere. It's an intense environment in the interview room. Now, the atmosphere you can create, it can be one of intimidation. I know we're not about threat, promise, or inducement. 
But intim- if someone's intimidated because I'm professional and thorough and I walk in in a suit, all my papers lined up and ready to go, and the interview room is my place. So if they feel intimidated by that, that's not, uh, yeah, uh, you can't argue that. They feel intimidated because I'm professional. Well, I'm not doing anything wrong being professional. You can also play, and again, strategies for, for interview, the bumbling detective. You come mm-hmm. in there, the disinterested detective, and you just, yeah, yeah, whatever. You're listening to everything that's been uh, been said. I, and whether this is a strength or a weakness, I don't know, in the interview room, some people uh, listen to the word that's spoken, the actual word that's been spoken. I'm looking at the reaction from the person when I'm asking the question, what's the reaction? I'm getting more from what's not said than what is said. Hmm. And, yeah, it, it, it's worked for me in, in the interview rooms. What I would say about the interview room is how taxing it is. I would come out from an interview room and I would just be exhausted. Mm. I, would, I would be spent. I'd leave nothing nothing else. I, I give everything I've got. So just the intensity. And I, I would honestly feel sick before I went into an interview mm. room because of the pressure that you're putting on yourself. Similar that, feeling here. Am I doing that to you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't tell you how nervous I was when I. Was, you need a break. <laughs> I need a need a break. But yeah, th- those little tips. But mm. the other, the, probably the biggest tip is you've got to be yourself in the interview room. I've seen people. Mm. I've tried to copy people, their style, and it doesn't work because it's not me. I've seen people try to copy my style. It doesn't work. You've got to be genuine self in the interview room. Uh, that really, um, that's such an interesting last point. I don't think I've heard you say that, but it makes so much sense. I was not interviewing was never. My strength, I had other strengths. Uh, And I always figured it was because I, some of the crimes were so hideous, I could not be in the room with any respect for the person as a human being. And I'm sure I radiated that. And that was being myself. Whereas you would feel the repulsion yeah. and the anger on behalf of the community and yeah. the victims and things the same but you if you're I, able to cover it up I, I, much more successful that, uh, well you, you yeah. broke something down that's very interesting there I would cover it up I, I've sat opposite some despicable human mm. beings and I didn't give an ounce of judgment there and I'm just mm. yeah yeah we're just having, having a chat and they can mm. be talking you know we're talking um, murderers pedophiles Mm. saying the most horrific things, yeah. but they wouldn't get a reaction out of me. Yeah. And, uh, internally, I'd be f- feeling it, but uh, mm. on my face, mm. they w- wouldn't see mm. it. So a bit of, mm. bit of poker. But uh, yeah, anyway, sorry, I digress. But that was an exciting time. I was so excited that weekend thinking, because I remember it from my early days in police, and it's such a significant job. And I would have sat, loved to sit down opposite yes. him in an interview room. But uh, Because he, he had actually never um, uh, entered an interview in in. What I mean by that is he he had been interviewed, yeah. as in arrested, taken for interview. He'd been put before the coroner yeah. um, at a hearing while it was still unsolved. Um, he only ever uh, – he often wouldn't confirm even his name. Uh, if he spoke, it was to confirm his name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yes, the challenge yeah. between you and him uh, You would have had would to – uh, well, if no. we're talking the way to interview, you got to think outside the square a little bit. Like if you go in there – I was thinking I, I'm going to rattle him by being as strange as he is. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, would have been, that would have been my game, game yeah, plan. That's what yeah, that was, yeah. I was thinking. But anyway, we digress. It must have been – so 18 months you worked on it. Mm. Um, how did it feel when you knew when, – when you got to that point when – all the uh, all the ducks had lined up, and you knew mm. you were going to uh, going to arrest him. Mm. How, how did you feel and your team feel? Uh, really, really um, excited in a calm way. Yeah, because uh, it was just a done deal. Yeah. It, um, so it, by that I mean I had complete faith in the material we had put together. Yeah. Uh, arresting him was a bit of a challenge. He certainly was older. Yeah. Uh, but he. He grabbed him in the gym, was it? The, the yes. Yeah. So um, that that decision you have to make as yeah. as a, in our position, he, where he, to arrest? Everything he, about him indicated dangerous. Exactly. Yeah. Um, booby traps, guns, yeah. any anything. So the gym. I chose the gym because um, he had developed a habit of uh, going at a certain time. Yep. So we had reliable geography that we we could set up yeah. securely. He had an affection for a particular treadmill, so he knew precisely which one in the group 
and we knew uh, to keep the other treadmills occupied yep uh by people who could handle <laughs> handle things if it got out of uh control and um yeah so that was a successful day there were over 80 police involved um that was after the aid memoir as i've described it yep. was put put in front of a legal panel, which is unusual. Yeah. But because of the size of the job, um, I guess the status of the victims, but also the the nature of it being unsolved for so long for the New South Wales Police Force, yes. um, the my hierarchy, which was also your hierarchy, yeah. uh, didn't want to risk failure. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was more than happy to do that. I understood why I had been asked to do that and, and, it, mm. and it had the green light. So, yeah, um, it was a good day. Yeah, a great day. When uh, Matt Heffernan and Matt Russell, yep. uh, so Matt Russell was my detective sergeant on the job, a great, great um, rapport builder with witnesses and yep. things. So they were they were doing the arrest, of course, and when they've put their, their common arm on on Warwick, he's um, and taken his sports bag. His first words and only words yeah. were, uh, "There's there are no explosives in it." <laughs> so, oh. Which of course that is my uh, biggest regret. A, I would have had so much fun with him. He's <laughs> he's not a man you do, you trust his words. So we yeah. checked. <laughs> so, yeah. And the bomb squad standing by and everything. So so I, I want to ask this because when you work on an investigation of that intensity and that. Mm. Did you feel, and I'm uh, like from a personal point of view, did you feel um, uh, excitement after after the arrest? Did you feel pressure off, or what? Did you feel numb? Because sometimes you have different reactions when you you get a result with investigations. Yes. Uh, no. No. It was. I know. I do know what you mean. With this one, it was very satisfying. Yeah. We had, and I think I'm, I said it at the time, we had worked in the shadows for a very long time. We weren't going out saying, "Look at what we're doing." Yeah. And the primary reason, two reasons, is we too didn't dangerous. want him to get active again. <laughs> yeah. But but equally, your place get blown up. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a good. That's call. important. Yeah, I reckon I was. I reckon that was sensible. <laughs> but the victims, yeah, and their families had been through so much, the highs and lows of big big investigation, yeah. lots of heavy investigators. It's going to be successful, and and were let down terribly. Yeah. It was 40 years, nearly to the day, before it was entirely resolved. So, I we were working in the shadows. One, yes, yeah. for safety. Two, we didn't tell them we were working on it again. Yeah. Because we, I wasn't going to promise something and then not deliver. So it was great. What was great is at that time, on the day of arrest, we of course started been letting them know, gently. Um, uh, the big satisfaction was. Um, the comfort we were able to give them yes um that they hadn't had for such a, mm. a long long time uh that was really significant a uh, heavy weight was yeah. off yeah okay and he was convicted uh yes yeah, so he uh toyed with the family court earlier yeah. with through his crimes over years his his own family court matter might have been slightly shorter than yours his went for 7 years yours uh, mine went for quite some time his went for Let's 7 not years talk about that. We, he was very good at it so mm. when he got arrested he um he uh, you know a number of things happened of course but part of it was he manipulated the court system again yeah. this time the criminal court the supreme court it took 5 years yeah. after arrest and a 22-month trial for him to be found guilty. It was Judge Ernie yeah. for him to be found guilty. And he was uh, sentenced for three murders. And um, he got life, so three yeah. three life sentences, plus if we add up the rest, 250 or so years of imprisonment for the connected incidental yeah, yeah, crimes. The, the bombing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, it was a good. That was another good it, day. It was a good day. But um, I, I won. I was proud being part of the New South Wales Police when that was uh, uh, that case was solved. I'm very proud of you and your, your team on on what you did because I saw how hard you worked on it. But uh, and I, I, what I like about it too, it sends out a message to all these uh, people that think they've got away with uh, crimes that uh, hey, there might be people 
just like you and your team working on them and uh, they never know when they're going to get the knock on the door or get their uh, their training in the morning yeah. interrupted. <laughs> Did you let him finish his uh, his training session or just grab him off off the running machine? But no, that that was that was mm. I, I think all the the good elements of what cold case and unsolved homicide and reinvestigation should be about came came into play play with that one. So uh, full credit. And it was significant, wasn't it? Like I can't remember a crime of that that magnitude and attacking the you know our justice system. Yes, well, it was described, yeah. um, including by the Prime Minister, but other other people, as the most significant case of domestic terrorism um, uh, attacking our our democracy and system of justice. Yeah. That's they're the terms being used over over that 40 years <laughs> and what uh, like with each investigation um, it takes a little piece of uh, out of you or whatever what price did you pay in uh, in that investigation could I before that and you I'm can do happy anything to you want. answer I'm that I, I want to, to are you curious yeah. what his motivation was oh yeah yeah, <laughs> let, yeah that might that might be <laughs> so, forgot that don't take over the podcast this is my podcast <laughs> yeah. but that's a good question it, it's um, I'm going to say topical now but it always has been and should be it's was domestic violence yeah. related it was as straightforward as he was a violent boyfriend mm. to andrea a violent husband to yeah. andrea um he also had um psychopathic tendencies but so many do he, he, was, he was a fireman wasn't he and he, that was yeah. the other part yeah. he was a full-time yeah fireman yeah uh, so had the appearance of normality, but a brute. Yeah. And and it's I don't even know how to ex- express it, but clearly it's a an example of how if domestic violence isn't properly attended to, yeah, or stopped, eliminated would be good. Yeah. Then these things, these um, further crimes. It, things can grow out of it, and it's all mm. bad. Yeah. And yes, so that it, you know, its very essence is domestic and, violence. And, and that, the, the essence of domestic violence. It, correct me if I'm wrong, but from my understanding of it, the the bombing at the Jehovah's Witness Church was because that's where his ex-wife a, attended that that church. That, yes. Well, he's um, he's because they, they were they were offering her shelter. Yes, so yeah. he his wife's sister mm. um, asked members of of that was her congregation mm. to help move Andrea away to safety, um, and and they did that generosity of spirit which mm. normal good people do. Um, they moved uh, covertly, so secretly, and um, and she was she was just sick of the violence mm. and uh yes he got to learn not specifically that they had helped but he's uh, he learned enough enough just just to target them in case they yeah. had um helped so uh, it really is uh, a mindset you, it, it's, it's incomprehensible it, it is incomprehensible that put a bomb in a, a church with yeah 100 people in there that the, the, the rant and i remember when your team um were looking at the investigation before you you took it on. They were getting statements from eighteen month old child at the time that mm. had a, a cut from the explosion. Like yes. it, it could have, who knows who, how many people he could have killed with that. But he just didn't yes. care. He didn't care, and um, I I um, I I fully expect that he thought there would be more fatalities. Mm. It really is just how the bomb is packed. Um, and he, we, whilst we didn't know it was him at that time, we were we were learning that the bombs were more amateurish than professional. Right. Okay. So, so the damage wasn't. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 a question that I think people would be wanting to ask is: I, I've got my my thoughts on it, but um, why, like those uh, those major offences occurred years ago? What did he get up to post those offences? What was he? What was his life? Did he have? Was there any other episodes of violence or things that he, uh, he did? So, uh, when we arrested him, um, he was in the company of his new family. Yeah. 
wife, um, children. Yeah. Um, so he, the passage of time and it being unsolved for so long had allowed him to live a full life, mm. um, reap the benefits of a government pension, mm. and um, uh, pretend he was a normal, good person. Yeah, and it does tie into what's going on now, but that's the extremes that uh, people go to when the, when the emotion kicks in. What was the price you paid personally for that? It was a very heavy period because it was also the period that I'd been given the Scott Johnson matter. Right, okay. So, so there was a lot of uh, sleeping in the car in the basement and not yeah. going home and um, keeping clear focus on both high-profile jobs. Yeah. Okay. So it was so intense. When, when, when you, you, you joke or say it wasn't, the, um, yeah, you didn't pay a price, but you basically had to forego your private life and just concentrate on work for those people. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, now, that's fairly heavy topic. So let's uh, delve into another fun fact. I, I think it's fun. It's funny in, in some regards. It was a bit confronting in, in others. Just set the scene. We'd been living together for a long time. We'd broken up. We'd both... I think we'd both remarried at this particular point in time, or you had remarried, I was getting remarried, and uh, I was approached by um, some writers to do an Underbelly TV series, Underbelly Badness. They they appro- approached me, and uh, senior police actually pointed them to me, which is quite ironic because mm. it worked against my career for the rest of my time. But uh, senior police pointed them there, and they wanted to do a story about they'd done the, the Melbourne one, they'd done the King's Cross, and they, they said, we want to do a story about policing, um, but following the police. The police will be the main characters, and, and we know the job that you're running, and we'd be really interested in um, you know, doing covering you in the uh, in the series and they asked me about my personal life and I said I was divorced and they said that's good and I said I had a relationship with someone I worked with and I can see him writing notes going that's great blah 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 and so the series was who was it <laughs> young it was, <laughs> it was that, you that poor woman <laughs> I think as history dictates it was you young so We'd had that, and the relationship was out in public and all that. We'd been there, done that. And then I come to you, and I think you'd just been recently remarried or about to get married. And I said, look, Underbelly are going to do a story about uh, about my career. And you've gone, eh, that's good, and uh, like that. And I said, but they want to talk about my private life. Are you happy for you to be included in my private life? I can't remember the response I got, but it was not dissimilar to the stare that you're giving me now. <laughs> and it was basically, whatever you said, it was more eloquent than this, but I interpret it as, what the fuck? <laughs> and <laughs> I think you said, look, I'm not guaranteeing, I, I'm, I'm not giving permission, but I will sit down and speak with the riders and just see what they're, what they're going to cover. Um, it was an interesting experience for both of us, wasn't it? Ah uh, yes, it was. So my irritation was that you know how even today how Australian society likes their heroes to be male, and they have to have their male heroes have a love interest. So I was reduced to a love interest. That was quite irritating. But it was very brave of you because you did say yes. I did say yes, and I even gave permission for my name to be used. And I was asked at work, "Why on earth, you know, why would you do that?" And because I, I don't have any shame over these things. Yeah. And it, it was fun. And yeah. but goodness, um, it certainly upset some male egos <laughs> in your peer group, did it not? Oh yes, oh yes, de- definitely. I, I think after that. Um, yeah, I had a had a target on my back. Not the not the, and I I put it this way. And if you're listening, I don't care. The genuine detectives that all did hard work would come up and say that's great because it was the ones that didn't do any work but were, had the shits that uh, they weren't featured in a TV series. But from our point of view, I thought it was very gracious gracious of you to say yes, you'll do it. And it was quite funny. I, I remember the first um, episode, like people were saying, do you, uh, we'll come around and watch it with you or whatever. And, that, and I said, no, I'll, I'll watch it on my own. And then watching our private life play out on TV, <laughs> I think I was in the fetal position sucking my thumb going, <laughs> yeah. no, make it stop. It, it, yeah, it was, um, yeah, um, 
very it's sort of unbalancing or is that a term or something quite um yeah confronting and then watching our relationship break down not only our relationship start on the show and then the relationship break down yeah it, there was even more hilarious <laughs> Well, I was sad, Pam. I don't know about you. I was sad. I'm not saying I was going. To, I was crying. At the end of the day, sort of harmless fun, really. It, it, well, it was harmless fun, and when when you look at it, uh, the actress that played you absolutely nailed you and got your voice down pat. I don't know how that uh, that came about, but uh, and I, my walk. It, it, I don't know what you had said about my walk, but. She perfected it. Yes, yeah, she did uh, <laughs> portray you very well. And I do remember after the first episode was played, and this is when you wonder what goes on in a homicide inspectors meeting, high level meeting. All the inspectors from homicide gather uh, with the commander of homicide. And uh, it was Monday morning or Tuesday morning after the first episode had played out. And we sit round the table, and there's all the inspectors there, and the commander talking about the cases and then I, I think it was someone piped up stuff that we're not talking about that what about these two <laughs> <laughs> yes yes goodness so yeah I, and I know there's problems with um, you know recruiting police and and that at the moment mm. and we should we should touch on that uh, mm. touch on mm. that briefly but look what can happen when you join the police <laughs> you can get <laughs> yes. a relationship play out on a high rating national tv <laughs> show and sit there and be embarrassed and you get to see the world as well what about our trip to paris <laughs> mm. can, this is like <laughs> yeah. the, the, you, you can't you can't make this stuff up and uh, mm. this is the life of uh, you know being in a relationship uh, two homicide detectives I remember um, you always Paris was your thing. You loved loved going to Paris, and you're always talking about. It. And I think you had a <laughs> trip planned to Paris. One of the benefits that we got when we were in the police work, working together is that occasionally we had to escort prisoners to overseas destinations. I think we did Fiji, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and then a trip to Paris came up. I'll tell you my my side of the story. I'd been on call, been called out to a. a, a bad murder, a murder of uh, Jaden March, a, a young uh, young child, and basically been up for 48 hours, was at um, headquarters swearing out a listening device, and it was a Friday, uh, mid-morning Friday, I had the kids for that weekend, mm-hmm. hadn't right. slept for 48 <laughs> hours, and you phoned me. So normal, at, normal week. <laughs> at this, uh, to get a, a sense of the chaos, and you phoned me, and I'm with uh, with. Jason, uh, Jason Evers, who's been on the podcast, uh, and a good mate, my uh, partner in uh, in work for years. You found non-intimate up. partner. Not non in- Well, yeah, we, we just could never get that uh, that working. Um, <laughs> he's uh, you'll phone me, and I am just stressed to the eyeballs, and I'm, I'm signing affidavits, and I, I know it's just going to be a chaos for the next uh, over the weekend. And you go, oh, Jubilant, we've got uh, an offer. Do you want to go to Paris for the weekend? And I'm thinking, well, of course I want to go to Paris for the weekend, but I'm a little bit busy at the moment, <laughs> haven't slept. And I think I said no to you. And I hung up. And Jason goes, who was that? And I said, it was Pam. She's, uh, we've got one of those extraditions to Paris for the weekend, but there is no way I can go. We're signing out listing device warrants. We've got to install them. I've got to in- interview the suspect <laughs> in a couple of days. And he's gone, you're mad. Why, why don't you? And he <laughs> talked me into it. I phoned you back and said, stop. I'll go. From my point of view, I then had to finish signing out the warrants, plan everything, drive back to the Central Coast, um, pick up my uh, change of clothes, pick up my passport, take I think it was Jake, uh, it was Jake and Gemma to swimming <laughs> swimming <laughs> practice because I had them for the weekend. Phone my father and say, can you meet me on the highway? I'm coming down. Can you look after Jake and Gemma for the weekend? Coordinate things. I was on the phone the whole time, totally strung out. We get to the airport at about nine o'clock and the prisoner is handed over to us, this mad Frenchman. And remember, he was carrying a didgeridoo. Yes. And they, What he had done, he'd come into the airport and uh, flew in, had assaulted someone, uh, assaulted an AFP officer or one of the uh, workers there, so they didn't let him in, and he had to be escorted back to uh, back to Paris. So we get on the plane. I am dead tired. We put the prisoner... We've got the three seats down the back of the plane, put the prisoner near the, near the window, and he misbehaved the whole time. I remember there was a stopover at um, Hong yeah. Kong. You yeah. had to get off the plane. I wasn't allowed to get off mm. the plane. I had mm. to stay with him. Mm. You had to take our passports. Mm. 
Then Heathrow. Remember, at this time, yes. I don't think I'd slept for seventy-two hours mm. wrestling mm. with him, and he would he would be just elbowing me and just carrying on a treat. And uh, we get to Heathrow Airport, and the only way we didn't really have any power with those extraditions, did we? <laughs> it was just sort no. of it was bluff. Yes, it was. So we've and got they, <laughs> the yeah. people who asked us to do it knew that. Yeah. So yeah. we uh, we uh, yeah. said to uh, uh, he gets off at the. Uh, Heathrow and we've got a three hour stopover and I'm pointing to the because he didn't speak English I'm pointing to the um, the police walking around with guns and pointing at the guns and pointing <laughs> at him and with his passport <laughs> pretending to rip it up and throw it <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the bin to try and control him mm. and he responded saying he'll settle down by if I take him in remember they had those smoking rooms a little fish tank yes, yes. and I had to sit there for three yes, hours yes, yes. in this smoking room <laughs> And then we got to pa- oh no when we got to Paris remember he turned it on at um, Charles de Gaulle <laughs> Airport and started fighting with us and the French I got on with him fine I don't know what your issue you was you were asleep in the seat in front <laughs> I remember that trip I was stuck with him the whole time and then you get to Paris and go well here we are I am totally strung up but anyway it was a fun trip and then you got cranky at me because um, we had to go back. Um, because I had to interview the suspect for the murder. And only you could do the interview. There wasn't another person on the planet who could possibly have done it. I'm very proud of that interview, and we got a conviction, and it was a very important interview. But you had, you were just so cranky at me because we had to go home a day early from Paris. You got your conviction, and all I got of my holiday, might have seemed like work to you, but that was my Paris holiday, is a photograph of you asleep. On a park bench. <laughs> well, <laughs> but it's a Parisian park bench. That's the important thing. It, it, and I still have that photo. <laughs> it, it, it was a fun trip. But I remember we got back and we were just so tired and we thought, no, oh, no, we can roll into work. But they yeah. were interested. We did. We went uh, but we tra- straight traveled the back. World. And I think the first trip we actually had without a prisoner was to Vietnam. And we yes. had no one to talk to because we didn't have a prisoner between us. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, join the police and see the world. It is another another, <laughs> yeah. another layer of it. But it was a uh, fun uh, fun time, wasn't it, it? It it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we had to do things like that. There wasn't, you know, we were not as ranked as we became. And you had... Uh, family responsibilities so we we took took advantage of anything free that came along <laughs> yeah so yeah so, just just take this prison yeah. I, I think the bloke we took back was at hong kong he was described as hannibal lecter he was one of the nicest blokes i've yeah. ever had when he handed over <laughs> when he was handed over to us people going be careful be careful but we got on famously yeah. but uh yeah they, yeah. Were, they, were, they were fun times yeah but anyway yeah. we talk some heavy stuff but there's also some fun times to uh to policing and the, yeah. the chaos that uh, and it's not not your average uh, average life but there's uh some exciting things that uh, play out, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, when we get back, we're going to, uh, for part four, we're going to continue uh, continue the chat uh, with Pam, but we're going to talk about and something, this is where you know, we better enjoy ourselves now because the Scott Johnson matter that uh, you were heavily involved in and uh, I, I think it's fair to say that particular um, investigation was the tipping point of your career in the, in the New South Wales Police. Yes. So... Try and keep a smile on your face when we get back <laughs> part four. I'll remind you of some uh, fun fun memories. But uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about the Scott Johnson matter. And it's played out very publicly. Um, and we'll get an insight from uh, Pam's perspective on, on that job. So, See you then. Mm-hmm. 